We'll be reading in Isaiah 44 in a, in a little bit. If you haven't met Teraphim yet, he's our new idol in the church right here. He, he's, um, he'll be up here for your worshipful experiences after, after church, if you'd like. Um, healthy people on the, um, on the inside, on the inside. I'm not talking about healthy people on the outside. I'm talking about healthy people on the inside. are not those who do not battle some life-controlling substance. A healthy person isn't necessarily somebody who attends and participates in a local church such as this. A healthy person isn't necessarily somebody who has a great family life and or maybe have made generally good decisions for their life. Healthy people, my friends, when I talk about healthy people, I'm talking about people who derive their internal life from the right sources. That's what I would call a healthy person. I get my internal life, my thought life, my points of motivation. I get them from the right source. I don't, I don't get them from um, exterior sources, nor do I look for them there. At least I don't look for them very long. It's very important, and we try in our teaching and preaching here at Grace Connection to always remember um, Jesus is all about the inward life more than the outward life. Christianity is, is wrought internally more than externally. We'll see a little bit later in the message, we flip that around sometimes. We make our Christian life external and not internal, um, even creating an idol out of it. Now, Mark, Mark 7, verse 15, it's not what goes into your body that defiles you, Jesus said. You are defile what comes from the heart. The Lord is saying here, it's not what we do that defiles us, but the corrupt soil in our souls that grows that behavior. Virtually all areas of human weakness... That'd be outward weakness, besetting sin, addictions, and stuff. All areas of human weakness and inward weakness, fears, loneliness, insecurities, unmet needs, can be traced back to an ancient practice, idolatry. We title the message, Little Stone People. I was going to title the message, Stoned in St. Petersburg, but that might get me in trouble. So I didn't do that. So it's little stone people. We don't worship idols like this. At least I hope you don't worship idols like this. We don't worship idols like this in 2014 in America, but there is idol worship going on in 2014 in America. Virtually, I would say, virtually almost in every life. And we want to look at that a little bit this morning. The word idolatry, teraphim, which I named our little pal over here, comes from the root word that means healer. He becomes a healer. He has a, he has a promise attached to him that I can give you something. I can heal you. That's what the root word for idolatry means, healer. G. Campbell Morgan, a great commentator from a century and a half ago or so, not that long ago, about 100 years, um, wrote this on modern idolatry. He says, materialism is a perpetual lust. I thought this was interesting. An unanswered agony of desire. Sensualism is a deadly opiate. Novelty in a, is a pernicious irritant. It is a fruitless search. There is no substitute for the Word of God directly heard by the Spirit of man and obeyed. Restlessness is a fever, and fever is a destroying fire. Now, today you came to church, you're getting free food at Chick-fil-A. Life can't get any better than that. But if I told you this, if I said, hey, next week, if you come back, um, I'm going to give you all a million dollars. You think we might have a full house next week? Yeah, you'd bring friends, huh? You'd get your friends, you'd get everyone, and say, you'd get your next door neighbor and say, hey, you come to church with me, I'll give you $10,000. <laughs> Make a profit on that deal. And, um, and so, but, and you could, you'd show up, the, the preacher promised us a million dollars if we come to church. So you all pile in here, and, I, and I'd say, hey, I, I want to give you a million dollars, I just don't have it. Sorry. You're not going to like me, first of all. And, um, but see, the problem is, I made you a promise, but I couldn't back it up. I couldn't deliver the promise. That's what idolatry is. It makes you a promise. I'm the healer. I'm going to give you something you need. I'm going to meet a need that is unmet. I'm going to fulfill you in a way that you feel unfulfilled. I'm promising you this. I can be your healer. 
but it's just a little stone person. It has no life. It has no power. It has no ability. Idolatry is when my trust is transferred from God to another object, a person, a skill, a talent, or an experience. Somebody else's definition, not mine. Now, go to Isaiah 44, common popular passage in idolatry. Um, God is talking to Israel through the prophet Isaiah here. Let me read you a good portion of this passage. A carpenter, verse 13, stretches a line. He marks it out with a pencil. He shapes it with the planes and marks it with a compass. He shapes it into the figure of a man with the beauty of a man to dwell in a house. He cuts down cedars and he chooses a cypress tree or an oak and lets it grow strong among the trees of the forest. He plants a cedar in a rain to nourish it. Then it becomes fuel for a man. He takes part of it and warms himself. He kindles a fire and he bakes bread. Also, he makes a god and worships it. (laughs) He makes an idol that falls down and falls down before it. Half of it burns in the fire. Over the half he eats meat. He roasts it and is satisfied. He also warms himself and says, Ha-ha, I'm warm. I have seen the fire. And the rest of it he makes into a god, his idol, and falls down to it and worships it. And he prays to it and says, Deliver me, for you are my god. See what he's saying? The carpenter cuts down the wood. He builds things, takes some of that wood, makes a fire, cooks his food on the fire, then saves a little bit of that wood and makes a little idol. Yeah, I got, I got wood, I got a fire, I got a house, and I got a God. <laughs> I'm going to worship my God. I just made it. Not a real big God. <laughs> Not a real powerful God, because I made it. But that's my God. He worships it. Um, verse 18. And they know not, nor do they discern, for you shut their eyes... So they cannot see in their hearts, so they cannot understand. No one considers, nor is there knowledge or discernment to say, half of it is burned, half of it I burned in a fire. I have also baked bread on its coals. I roasted meat and have, and have eaten. And, I'll say, and, uh, and shall I make the rest of it an abomination? Shall I fall down before a block of wood? Interpreter says this about this commentating on this verse. He says he warns about this type of empty, well-worn religion. Behind it, behind it all stands his invincible faith, talking about Isaiah, in one God, exalted and sovereign in the earth, pres- present in the hearts and the consciousness of men, available to all who cry to him, yet invisible and holy, whom men apprehend not by seeing of the physical eye, but of the eye of faith and the revelation of the word of God. So I worship, down, I worship my block of wood. Verse 20, he feeds on ashes. A deluded heart has led him astray, led him astray. And he cannot deliver himself or say, is there not a lie in my right hand? Verse 20 in the message um, Bible says this, the lover of emptiness, same verse, just the message Bible is just very, very contemporary. The, the lover of emptiness of nothing is so out of touch with reality, so far gone, that he can't even look and see what he's doing, can't even look at the no God stick of wood in his hand and say, this is crazy. <laughs> the idolater, Gill says, delights in his idol. He places himself, pleases himself, himself with and seeks comfort and satisfaction from it, fills and feeds himself with hopes and expectations of being helped and delivered by it. But all, but this is all vain hope, a mere delusion. It is as if a man fed on ashes instead of food, it is feeding on that which has no savor, no substance, can yield no nourishment, but on the contrary is pernicious and hurtful. So God's mocking the idol worshipers, saying you make this idol and you worship it. It's endless. It's, you're feeding on ashes. It's empty. It has no power to do anything for you. Now, none of us are going to worship teraphim up here. And none of us probably have a little thing at my house. We have a little wood here where I have my candle burned to it or, or a crystal or something like that. At least if you do, please see me or Dr. Lewis after church. We'll pray deliverance for you or something like that. 
We don't really deal with that type of idol worship today. It's not something that we, we really address, not in America anyway. All the nations, they still deal with some of these things. But do you think Satan is so narrow-minded that this is the only type of idolatry that he would use? He'll use anything to replace God. He, he'll use anything to convince you there's another healer than Jesus Christ. And that's what we want to look at a little bit today. How does idolatry happen, first of all? Where is the internal soil of our souls? How does that take place that lets it grow? Well, we could probably have lots of things to say about this, but quickly, I want to say three basic things about this. Number one, we enter into idolatry because we lose our consciousness of God on a personal level. McLaren says we ignore God. See, we often draw, draw close to God in trials and heartache, so, but become complacent when all is smooth. For instance, everything's going good. The marriage is good. The finances is good. The career is going good. No good, good health checkup at the doctors. And, and not that this happens to everyone, but sometimes, hey, things are pretty good. God, I'm just going to take you and place you over here for a little bit. And, uh, but don't go too far away because I'm sure at some point I'll need you again. <laughs> it's a crisis. Christ, we call it. Then the doctor's report comes in that it wasn't very good. Oh, God. Remember how tight we were, are. Forgive me for walking away. Um, we all have done it. That's why I don't think a lot of people can actually stand the test of prosperity. Prosperity makes us just relax and our spiritual tauntness, the bowstring, Hebrews 12, 3, loosens. So we lose our consciousness of God on a personal level. In other words, he, we stop fearing him. Fearing not in the sense we'd think in our English, but fear in the, in the Hebrew. And the Greek simply means I have an awe. I'm awed by God. I'm taken away by his presence. Meeting him every morning puts me into um, this state of worship. Thinking about redemption and the work of the cross captures my heart. There's an awe of God in my life. There's a sense where, and this is what thankfulness will do for you and praise will do for you. You'll, you'll wake up and you'll keep the awe of God fervent in your life and high in your life. Because when God stops to being God, when he stops being high and lifted up and majestic to us, something else has to fill that role. We're going to worship something. We're going to rely on something. We're going to try to derive life from something. And if it's not him, it's being replaced with teraphim. Second, we, we enter into idolatry because we don't like God's provision. A good example of this is, is um, on Mount Sinai. Moses went up. He's gone much longer than people thought he was going to be gone. Next thing you know, they're building a golden calf. We often don't think God is able to do for us what we want or think we need to be done. So we create our own idols. Good illustration of this is, is in Israel, when Israel went into the promised land and they're supposed to drive the Canaanites out. And of course we know they didn't. They did to a point, then they stopped it, quit the job. Then before you know it, within a half a generation, the Canaanites, I mean the Israelites, were worshiping the Canaanite gods, Asherah and different gods they had. The Canaanites were, they were more like naturalists. They, they looked at the soil and they, the sun and the moon and the rain and the dirt and all the stuff, that, and that's what they would worship. So, God, so the, Israel, the Israelites come into their land knowing that God delivered them and watched the power of God in Egypt and watched the water come from the rock and watched the manna grow on the, on the ground every morning. They watched all those things, but then they looked at the, this beautiful land of milk and honey, and they said, hey, you know, maybe these Canaanite gods had something to them. I mean, this is a pretty nice place. So maybe we should sort of mix the two. That's why Isaiah said on Mount, I'm sorry, Elijah said on Mount Carmel, he looks at Israel before the big battle with the prophets of Baal and said, how long will you halt between two opinions. How long we go back and forth? Either worship God or worship Baal, but get off the fence. That's what Elijah's saying. Because they looked and said, would God, 
I know God delivered us from Egypt. I know he brought seven plagues. I know he brought us manna in the morning. I know he brought water out of the rock. But could he give us a good crop? Is he that big? Could he keep this land as fertile as it is? is could he really do that? Maybe we got to keep our hand on. The gods of the Canaanites. I had a dear man came to my church for years. He's, he's um, and this is not by any stretch of the imagination, it's a crack on any denomination, but I thought it was cute. He would come every Sunday, but he'd go to a Catholic church every Saturday night. And I, and I asked him, I said, how come you go to church, or a Catholic church on Saturday night, and you come to church here on Sunday? How come you do that? And I just was curious. And he was a good man, he was a good friend of mine. And he says, I just want to make sure. <laughs> he goes, he said, I'm, I'm not sure exactly who's right, you or them. So I'm going to go to both, and just, I just want to cover all my bases. So he said, so, so, he, so he went to both, and he did for many, many years. He went Saturday night to Mass, Sunday morning here, because he just wanted to make sure he had all his bases covered. <laughs> Number three, we enter into idolatry, third point, because of unmet needs. This is a big one. An unmet need will always point to a place of deficiency in our day-to-day -day walk with God. Now, don't get me wrong. Every one of us have unmet needs. Me, starting right here. This is why so many burn out. You know, the average pastor lasts um, four years in ministry. Four years. They go to school, they get degrees, and they go get into the pulpit men, they last four years. You know why? They never taught them in Bible college that sheep bite. <laughs> Sometimes sheep bite. And I didn't know these sheep, I thought these sheep were going to follow me, not nibble on me. <laughs> and, um, and so they, they, they can't take the personal rejection and the personal scrutiny they're put under, so they quit. I'm not saying that's right, I'm just saying what it is. The point I'm, I, I get at there is, sometimes we'll create a relationship with God that isn't personal. In other words, I create my relationship with God as ministry, it's studying the Bible, it's memorizing Scripture, it's working in Sunday school or, or working in a, a, some, something like that. And then I create my relationship with God. When I, how's your relationship with God? Well, it's simple. It's I do Sunday school and I, and I, and I work in a, in a kids' connection and I, and I donate time here, I do this there, and, and I, I'm on my yearly Bible reading plan. And, and not that any of those things are wrong. They're all wonderful and good. But is it personal? Are you driving life from above, or is that your life? If that's all I'm doing, if that's my Christian life, and it's not including a, a personal time of fellowship with Jesus Christ where I'm being filled with His Holy Spirit, I could be pulling in the teraphim of religion. I need more. This is the unmet needs. I need this. We create an idol to meet that need. Need could be money, could be sex, substance abuse, could be anything. And idolatry raises the notion that God lacks power. Let me say this, my friends. I'm going to get into the four areas of modern idolatry. When God looked at the human race and saw the human race's deepest needs, he came up with a plan to meet them. That. That cross. That was his plan to meet you in your deepest needs. He looked at addiction, he gave us a cross. He looked at loneliness, he gave us the cross. He looked at um, self-consciousness, he gave us the cross. He, gave, he looked at fear, he gave us the cross. The cross was God's very best. It was the very best of God's love. It was the very best of God's wisdom. It was all of God's power. All went into a cross to meet man where man needed to be met. Basic level in his life. There was nothing else but that. That's the best God has. There is no better It'll never be any better. There'll never be anything more powerful, no, nothing ever more transformational but that cross. That's why we preach about it, we teach about it, we think about it, we thank God for it. Do we know what it did for us? 
Next five weeks, we have a series, Fantastic Five. That's what we're going to be talking about. What that cross did. That's my answer. You don't like what's on the inside? Go there. You struggle with this? Go there. Start there. That's where we start. Let's drill down a little bit into these four areas of modern idolatry. First of all, there's a people-based idolatry. This is what you'd call today as codependency. I remember when codependency became a real word. It was in the 80s. And I had some folks come in for counseling and they said they were codependents. And I thought they meant they were part of a court trial and they were co-defendants or something like that. I didn't know quite what they were even talking about. And so I, and so I said, I, I, being as smart as I was, I looked at them, mm-hmm, oh, that, well, okay. And I went, we talked to them an hour, then I, I went home and, and I, I, I said, I got to find out what that is. I don't even know what they're talking about. <laughs> so I ran to the Christian bookstore, found one book. There was only one book written on codependency back that time, Mel and Betty's book. There's like 700 of them written on now about it, but there was uh, maybe 7,000. And there was, and um, I remember reading them, oh, that's what codependency is. It's people idolatry. It's easier when I put it into a Bible framework. <laughs> it was just people idolatry. I look to others, the opposite sex, friends, acceptance in a social circle by means of evaluating my worth, even motherhood or fatherhood to evaluate my worth. We have to elevate above that. How a man or a woman accepts or rejects you cannot evaluate your worth. You're worth more than that. You're worth more than another human being stupid. You're worth more than that. You're worth more than being mistreated. You're worth more than that. Christ has placed you in a divine family. You have a you are of, of consummate value to him. Everyone in the human race is loved by God deeply. He died for everyone in the human race. The people-based idolatry. Then we have things-based idolatry. This is when we're addicted to our media. It's one of them anyway. That's a new addiction, by the way. Media addiction. Who has a cell phone on them? Who gets a little nervous if you're away from your cell phone for 10 minutes, 15 minutes? We have recovery groups for you. <laughs> I was driving here the other day, and I, was, I, was, I think it was Monday or Tuesday, I was driving here, I got almost right to the church, and I realized I left my cell phone at home. Fear gripped my heart. <laughs> I, 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 was, I was reaching for my cell phone to call my wife and tell her I left my cell phone at home. Then I, I realized I didn't have my cell phone, so I went to text my wife and tell her I left my cell phone. I didn't realize I had my cell phone, so I couldn't text. I was, I was hopeless. I was stranded. I didn't have my iPhone. Oh, no. Yeah. I made it, but it was hard. It was hard. I drove home, kicked in the door. Where's my phone? And, oh, let me send a text just to calm me. <laughs> and, and, and. Media addiction. I, my, my, my little 16-year-old granddaughter, Bree, she's, um, she's hearing impaired, so she really likes media and technology and stuff like that. And when they knew the new iPhone was coming out, my goodness, the heart. <gasps> I need it. I need it. I need the new iPhone. But the other iPhone's four months old. I know, but I need the new one. I need the new iPhone. I need the new iPod. I need the new iPad. I need it. I knew I, anything that's I, I need it. <laughs> It's a whole culture. And, um, so, and it's, it's, it's thing-based idolatry. I'm not saying I have a... Oh, it's over there, actually. I have an iPhone. I have an iPad. I have lots of iStuff. A couple iPods. I, I, I love this stuff. I like playing with it. I like apps. I like anything. I like it. Um, what did we do without it? Except have peace. <laughs> Things-based idolatry. This is a big one in America, my friends. Sometimes we think... More money, more stuff, more security. The, 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 the more I own, the better I think of myself. Then we have addiction-based idolatry. 500 classified addictions now in the psychological circles. Addiction simply is it's just any attachment to a thing or a substance that we are convinced we need for our happiness and fulfillment. A, a clinical definition is a, a, the continued repetition of, of behavior behavior 
despite adverse consequences or neurological impairment leading to such behaviors. Now, I understand there's a physical aspect in addictions as well as a psychological as aspect in addictions. But that's what addiction is, my friends. Something that we come, become dependent upon outside of Jesus Christ. Then we have, lastly, religion-based idolatry. This is a big one. Happens, this could happen to all of us starting right here. Religion become idolatry? That's what idolatry was, was religion. They worshipped this. They worshipped the thing that promised them as a healer. Numbers chapter 21, you know the story. I'll recount it for you a little bit. They just got kicked back into the wilderness after Kadesh Barnea, and they went into the wilderness, and they had um, um, God sent these, these fiery snakes. They had this nasty snake bite, and they were biting the Isra Israelites, and they were dying. They had about 30,000 of them plus died by, by these snake bites. So they complained to God, and God told Moses, go, go make a, a snake a serpent out of brass, lifted up on a pole. And any time one of the Israelites get bit by a snake, have them look at that snake, that serpent, brazen serpent, up on that pole, and they'll be healed. So they did. They made that little brazen snake, and they stuck it on the ground. And every time someone got bit in the, in the camp, they would look up, and the snake bite, and the pain would go away, and they'd be healed, the brazen serpent. It's the type of Christ we see in John chapter 12. If I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto you. But now we fast forward 800 years to 2 Kings chapter 18. King Hezekiah, young guy, 25 plus years old or so, comes in and starts doing some much needed reforms in Israel. Israel had fallen into idolatry, all sorts of idolatry. They had blended in with their society, the Canaanite culture and such. Hezekiah comes in as a new king and says, enough of this, we're cleaning house. And he started going through the highways and the byways, getting rid of the Asherah poles and all the different idolatrous things they worshipped. Then he was going through some trunk someplace. I'm adding dialogue to this narration. And it's wrapped in that trunk or someplace stuffed away. What did he uncover? That little brazen serpent, that little snake of brass. 800 years later. When they moved that camp and the snake stopped biting, they brought that, they brought that brazen serpent down. They said, hey, let's, this is amazing what God did with that. Let's take that and pack that away. And they moved, and everywhere they moved, they brought that brazen serpent with them. And, and when they finally set up camp and they built a real tent, they brought that brazen serpent with them. So here they are 800 years later, and they're worshiping that brazen serpent, which God gave them for a moment, and God gave them for a, a season of time to heal them. But now that's that religious idol, that religious piece of um, brass, which had far out used its purpose. God used it just for a moment. But they held it up. That's the brazen serpent. Hezekiah said, smash it. The word in the Hebrew, as you know, is netushan, nuhushtan, or break it up into little pieces. He took the religious relic and smashed it. How many of us have idols of religion? In the world of churchianity, now there's so many preferences. Let's, say, let's take music. There's so many preferences in music. I know for a fact that God likes the Gaitha vocal band. And that in heaven, Bill Gates will probably lead the worship, him and Gabriel. That's, that's, I know that for a fact. Anyone that believes otherwise is from the devil. <laughs> that's called Nahushtan. That's called religion. That's, that's called religion. Listen, there are other ways of doing it. You know, you go to Africa and they have these drums, and they just beat the snot out of these drums. They're worshiping. They couldn't do that here. I wouldn't want them to do that here. I'm not talking this church. I'm talking about America. Why? Because it's not our preference. Be careful to not to let your preferences become idols. Very careful. I have to be careful for that. I have preferences. Religious-based idols. This is when we, we take our religion and we, and we narrow it down to the outward and not the inward. We take our religion and we have, this is, what, this is what my Christianity is. I do this and I do that and I do this. And that could be Bible reading and that could be my time. All those, nothing, nothing wrong. Those are all good things. But is it personal or is it mechanical? 
is there interaction between you and God? I've tried to learn, teach myself in my own Christian life to hear the voice of God as he speaks to me. He never, as I've said so many times, he talks to me about me. He shows me things about his word, which I have found significant, in, especially in the last few years of my life, as I've needed him to intervene so desperately. But some of the great lessons I've learned, he's shown things about me. He showed me what makes me tick. Why this bothered me or that bothered me. Why I, my, mode, my real motives for doing this or acting that way or taught me about myself. I saw all sorts of little teraphims. Religious idols that popped up that were not personal. They were mechanical. Listen, what's, what's God's? Simply this. Life, value, purpose is available to all of us. What's it say? In gift form. How do I get it? All right, Pastor, I got idols. Fine. Fine. You convinced me again. I'm all convicted again. All right, for the last week I figured I got ants. Now I got idols. All right. If I went from ants to idols, you know. Thanks for making me feel good. I thought after beating me up for the last three weeks and I can come to church and I'm going to feel good. But no, no, just another idol message. And if I had ants crawling in my brain, now I worship little stone people. <laughs> no, actually, you'll, these next five weeks after this, you will be very, very blessed. I promise you. But the point is this. Jesus, my friend, wants to give you life. Life as he knows it. We can't earn it. We can't manufacture it. We can't manipulate it. We can't procure it. We can only receive it. And, and we receive life. It comes in the person of Jesus Christ. Idolatry, my friends, is a why question, not a what question. It's not what we do. It's why we do it. It's not what we do. It's what's, what's the, the point behind it. Since the Garden of Eden, we have been on a quest to find life. When Adam and Eve was thrust out of the garden, they've been on a quest. I have lost life. My life with God is gone. I need to find life. Where am I going to find life? Adam, are you going to be my life? Eve would say, Eve, no, are you going to be my life? Now, maybe we'll have children. Maybe that will be my life. And whatever it is, maybe we'll have good crops and success. Maybe that will be my life. No, they're always looking for life because the life they had with God was now severed. There was a ceiling there. The fellowship was hindered. But we had a Redeemer. We had a Jesus who came and died on a cross. He kicked the ceiling off so we could have life again. Not life like the law, religious law, but life. Real fellowship with Him. Real communion with Him. Being filled with the Spirit day to day, moment by moment, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Life. Life in the worst of situations, in the worst of circumstances. Life when I'm in great pain. Great life during great loss. He can give me life. Let me read you a few verses. John 1, 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. John 5, 21. For, the Father, for as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so the Son gives life to whom he will. Verse 24. Truly, truly, I say unto you, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal what? Life. He has not come into judgment, but has passed from death unto life. John 6, 48, I'm the bread of life. John 10, 10, I come to give you life more abundantly. John eleven twenty five. 25, I'm the resurrection and the life. John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. It's me. I want to be your focus of worship. I want to be your need meter. I want to meet you in the core of who you are. I want you to look to me, not a man, not a woman, not to money, not to substance, but to me. I want you to draw close to me every day. I want to be your life. There is no life. There's just little stone people that will promise you life. This money can't give you to you. A man, a woman, security, um, nothing can give you life. It only comes from one source. And God designed it that way. He wants to be our everything. My friends, the horizontal changes the horizontal is this it's life it's life as we live it it changes doesn't it we we start young everything's good we get old the back aches 
a little bursitis. We economics ups and downs. We say goodbye to people we never thought we'd say goodbye to. I visited a man last Wednesday, a week ago Wednesday. 42-year-old man, know the family very, very well. Six-year-old, beautiful family at home. Talking to him like we're talking. Told him about heaven, life, born again. Saturday at 7.30, he went home to be with Jesus. I've never seen anything so quick in my life. 42. Doesn't seem quite right. I sat with little Piper, his little daughter, and we talked about Frozen and stuff like that. And beautiful, beautiful wife, beautiful, beautiful daughter. This, the horizontal, there are no promises. There are no guarantees. It changes, doesn't it? If I'm looking, to, if I'm looking at it here, my friends, if I'm just anesthetizing myself through substance and so I don't have to deal with this, then I'm, never, I'm just running away from life. The horizontal will always change. It will morph throughout our lives. The vertical is constant. It's always there. It's always available. Jesus wants to be our everything. He wants to be your source for love. He wants to be your source for acceptance. He wants to be your source for security. He wants to be your significance. He wants to be your passion. He wants to be, he wants to be your everything, not a little stone person. We wouldn't worship him because that's stupid. <laughs> but you know, if I was to take this apart, and shortly after you all go, it'll probably be taken apart, you'll find that underneath my idol here is just a chair and some milk crates and um, a couple kids from Sunday school, <laughs> stuff like that. It's just, um, it's just, it's not that, um, it's really, it's, it, I know it's worshipful. I know you look at it, you want to fall down and in front of it and, and say, holy, 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 but, but there is, but it's really just, just, just stuff underneath there. Just like in Isaiah 44, it said, what? God said you're worshiping a piece of wood? There's no life in the wood. There's no life in that. There's no life in worshiping a husband or worshiping a wife. There's no life in having a million dollars in the bank. There's no life in that. You want life that's in one place. And that's in Jesus. He's the way, the truth, and the life. You don't have to worry about idolatry in your life. Just like you don't have to really worry about ants. Just get to know him. Find his presence every day. Practice his presence every day. You don't have to worry about automatic negative thoughts, ants. You don't have to worry about teraphims, idolatry in your life. They won't, they won't pose you any problem. When you are consumed with life, and I would say in John 1, 4, the light of life, Jesus, darkness is automatically repelled. I don't have to fight darkness. I just stay in the light. I don't have to worry about death. I just stay where the life is. You leave today and say, oh, my, I got idols. Next to me on the way home, I got a little stone person in my car, and I married a little stone person or whatever. It is, but listen, it's not about the idol. It's about going to where we'll find life. And we'll find it always in the presence of Jesus Christ. Always. Mm -hmm. Father, thank you for these words today and thank you for the precious people here. And every head bowed and every eye closed if you're here today and have never asked Jesus Christ to be your Savior. You're not joining our church. You don't be single out in any way, but on the webcast or here in our presence if you've never asked Christ to be your Savior. Salvation, my friends, starts in a moment of time. It's not an accident. You don't be, get saved or by going to church. You get saved by Jesus Christ. You don't have eternal life by doing good things, by being moral, or it's by the person Jesus Christ. He died on a cross for you and for the entire human race that whosoever believes on him, he says, will never perish but have everlasting life. If today you've never asked Jesus Christ to be your Savior, maybe you have and you don't have to do it again, but today's the first time that you've actually truly asked Christ to be your Savior. Maybe you're on the webcast, maybe you're in our chapel this morning. 
Say the simple prayer after me. Dear Jesus, in your own way, your own words, your own heart crying out to God, Jesus, thank you for dying on a cross for me. Thank you for shedding your blood for me. Thank you for paying for my sins so I could know you personally and intimately and be right with the Father. Come into my life today, the 17th day of August, and save me. If you've said that prayer, my friends, you put your hand up high. I just want to pray for you. Anyone? Thank you. Anyone else? Jesus on the webcast. Let us, let us know. Just type it in on the comment, and they'll, they'll look at that and find a way we can contact you. Father, teach me. Teach me. Show me, Father, through your Holy Spirit, these little idols in my life. Whatever they are, wherever they're hiding, these little stone people that want to just hide in the crevices of our thoughts and our hearts and show them to me through your Holy Spirit and teach me how to draw life from the only true source of life, Jesus' name.